Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Jose Museum of Art. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know me, my name is Holly Shen, and I am the deputy director here at SJMA, and I am very pleased to introduce tonight's program, um, which marks a new collaboration with Rhizome, an affiliate of the New Museum New York, uh, that champions digital-born art and culture through commissions, exhibitions, digital preservation, and software development. Uh, founded by artist Mark Tribe as a listserv, including some of the first artists to work online, Rhizome has played an integral role in the history of contemporary art engaged with digital technologies and the internet. Uh, given SJMA's strategic commitment to exploring ideas and technology at the intersection of the art and innovation communities, uh, we are so excited to launch this initiative uh, with a special project from 7 on 7, Rhizome's annual flagship platform pairing seven artists with seven technologists to create new things, artworks, prototypes, whatever they imagine, even whole movements. Um, the 11th edition of 7 on 7 debuted in New York last weekend, and tonight we have artist Hayal Pazanti and linguist Laura Welcher, who will give a West Coast premiere to their new collaboration. Um, we are so grateful to be able to align tonight's pr presentation with our new Facebook First Fridays series, um, a sponsorship launched this past February that keeps our doors open for free and late uh, the first Friday of every month. Um, so we want to give a big uh, thank you to Rhizome for their uh, collaborative spirit in tonight's partnership, and in particular to Executive Director uh, Zach Kaplan, who is with us tonight from New York. And as one of the core organizers and curators of this year's 7 on 7, Zach um, will give us a little bit more background on Rhizome and the 7 on 7 project. And, um, introduce tonight's presenters, and then he will also uh, moderate a short Q&A session after the presentation. So um, please join me in welcoming Zach Kaplan. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Zachary Kaplan. I'm executive director of Rhizome. Thank you for the introduction, Holly. Um, as Holly said, uh, you know, Rhizome was founded on the internet by a group of artists, and today our work is focused on championing born digital art and culture, and we do that through a variety of programs, uh, as well as our affiliation with the New Museum in New York City. Um, Seven on Seven is uh, our premier platform to explore what's urgent within the broad range of fields that comprise Born digital art and culture, and it does so through bringing together each year 14 really talented individuals from culture and technology to take a risk to work together for about a day. <laughs> that day is a bit is a bit of a misnomer, maybe, and see what happens. Um, the process is challenging, probably more challenging than we let on when the invitations go out. Um, but the results, as you'll see from Hayal and Laura's presentation, are always surprising and illuminating, and really up to the minute. It. Um, the reason why we founded 7 on 7 in 2010 was we felt a need for productive one-on-one -on -one collaboration between stakeholders from art and technology. Um, collaboration that could be taken up as equals, um, which is surprisingly unique in the history of art and technology experimentation. Um, and we found it to be a really successful, and I think what's core to that success is that um, both participants do come um, to one another as creators with different expertise and try to have um, a kind of interaction and, and some kind of uh, productive collaboration um, um, as co-creators. Um, throughout the years, I think when, actually, I think when we founded the program, the lines between art and tech felt really clearly drawn, but each year we've blurred and complicated, and now it's hard to tell who's who in each pair at the end of the day. Um, as Holly said, we presented the 2019 edition just last week in New York, and we're really excited to give a premiere to Hayal and Laura's project, which is one I, I really love. <laughs> um, it opened 7 on 7 in New York and really set the tone for the whole day successfully. Um, but before I introduce both Hayal and Laura, I just want to thank um, the whole team here, Sarah Baden, Holly Shen, Catherine Wade, uh, Lauren um, Dickens, Rory, uh, 
uh, the whole team for being passionate about Seven on Seven. Uh, many of them were uh, passionate enough to actually fly to New York last week to join the event, um, and also passionate enough to invite us here to present as part of this new Facebook Friday series. Um, and just as a side note, like it's it's really exciting what's happening in San Jose. This is a great museum run by really great people, and we're just excited to partner. So thank you. Um, now to introduce Hayal and Laura. <laughs> Uh, Hayal Pizanti is a painter and a sculptor who's in the collection of this museum, um, the Broad, or the, the Broad, the Broad, and LACMA in Los Angeles. I'm showing my, new, I've lived in Los Angeles, but I've been in New York for too long. Um, and LACMA in Los Angeles, and J.P. Morgan, among many other prominent collections. She shows at Jessica Silverman Gallery in San Francisco, and has presented at plenty of essential venues across the globe. Um, she has an MFA from Yale University. Laura Welcher is Director of Operations in the Long Now Library at the Long Now Foundation, just up the 101 a few miles. She engages with the deepest of time, forwards and backwards. She's also a linguist with uh, research interests in endangered language documentation, description and revitalization, as well as new forms of computational linguistics. Although, actually, I think it's computer-assisted linguistics, and I made it into something that's probably an entirely different field. She has a PhD in linguistics from the University of California, Berkeley, um, and I'm really excited to welcome them here tonight. So thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, yeah, as, as Zach said, my name is Laura Welcher, um, and uh, I work at the Long Now Foundation. Uh, first, I should tell you, we have this object on uh, our screen, our opening screen, and um, there's an object up here that looks a lot like it. It's, this is the three-dimensional version of this object, and we're going to be talking more about what this object is. And uh, It's supposed to be a little bit mysterious at, at, the, at the moment. Um, and we have one, uh, this is a terracotta version. Uh, we have one in bioplastic, a 3D printed version, that we'll be passing around, and you can, you can hold it, and you can think about it, and imagine maybe what you think it might be. Um, so, uh, yes, I work with the Long Now Foundation. I've been there for about 15 years. And the Long Now Foundation, which is, has its base up in San Francisco in Fort Mason Center, is an organization that was founded in 1996 to encourage long-term thinking in society on the scale of the next 10,000 years. So our scope of uh, our projects is for thousands of years. Um, and one of probably the best known project that we are working on right now is building a giant mechanical clock uh, in West Texas uh, that can tick and keep time for 10,000 years. Uh, and the project that I came to Long Now to work on many years ago, and I have worked the longest on, is called the Rosetta Project. And we're building an archive of the world's languages um, and then we're creating a very long-term archival backup of that in um, a, a particular kind of long-term media that I'll talk about called the Rosetta Disk. Uh, and this is a, an image of the Rosetta Disk up here. This is the first version of the Rosetta Disk that we made in 2008. And we chose language information uh, because we wanted to represent the world's linguistic and cultural diversity. And this is a picture that has been developing for thousands of years. The, the, the diversity of languages we see in the world is thousands and thousands of years old. And there's about 7,000 languages spoken in the world. Many of those are very small languages spoken by only maybe a few thousand speakers or less. Um, what we know today is that about 40% of those languages, or um, about 3,000 of them, are in danger of going extinct. Um, and we're trying to understand as linguists and scientists and the people who are speakers of these languages and, and their heritage descendants what this means. Um, and we don't really understand what we might be losing. I have a feeling that it's, it's kind of the encyclopedia of humanity that we're losing, uh, which is, is worrisome. Um, so anyways, that's why we chose the language content. And then our inspiration for the disc was the Rosetta Stone artifact that was discovered by Napoleon's soldiers in Egypt. And the, 
the thing about this artifact is it had the same thing written. It's a, it was a text, like a decree. Um, it was written in three different languages. It was uh, written, or well, three different writing systems. Um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, which were not known at the time. Uh, Demotic, which was a kind of script form of Egyptian. And, um, and then ancient Greek. And people knew the ancient Greek, um, and they knew a little bit about the Demotic. But because the text had the same was the same thing, they were able to compare it and figure out that Egyptian actually represented a spoken language. And that unlocked an entire civilization. So it was an amazing discovery. So that was our inspiration. And we collected information on the world's languages in that same kind of parallel structure. And we, we cr created a digital collection of thousands of languages with parallel content, the same text, the same vocabulary. Um, and then, the long-term backup version of it is this disk. Uh, this is the picture of what we call the human eye readable side. And this is um, from the first disk. It was made out of titanium. And the instructions are etched around the outside of the disk that says, this is an archive of the languages of the world. Uh, find something to magnify this with a thousand times, and you can read the content over, on over 1,500 human languages. And the archival side, which is the other side of the disk, has about 14,000 pages of parallel documentation on the world's languages. And you can read these pages just like you would read a book, but you need an, a, a microscope that can magnify about 1,000 power. And uh, here's an example of pages that are magnified about 100 times. So you can start to see indiv individual pages emerge. And then if you get about 400 power, you can start to actually read the text. Right? And that's, that's letters that are actually formed in the surface of nickel. And nickel can withstand high heat. It can handle saline environments. It's not going to corrode. And it's been tested and can last in some pretty tough conditions for a very, very long time. So we've made several of these Rosetta disks. We're continuing to collect language documentation. Um, more recently, in 2006, we released our first wearable version of the disk, which I have with me tonight. If anybody wants to take a look afterwards, I'm happy to show it to you. Uh, but the idea with this version is that we can make more of them. We started out making 100, 100 of them. But the idea is that lots of copies out there in the world can help keep the information safe for the future. Hi, um, I'm Hayad Pozanti. Um, and so, thank you, Laura. I'm going to talk a little bit about my work now. Um, so, speaking of languages, um, my work is visually based on an invented language. Um, it's called Instant Paradise, and there's 31 shapes in it. And each shape stands in for um, a letter and, an, uh, and a number. Um, it's a personalized encryption system, so I can write numbers or um, write sentences in, in kind of a more intuitive way. And um, and, I, and only I basically have the encryption method, but, um, but um, the titles of the work reveal the numbers that are embedded um, within the works themselves. So this is a work from 2015, and um, this is also a good introduction, I think, because it also speaks to my interests. Um, my work is generally based around um, a field of anthropology, or I'm inspired by a field of anthropology called cyborg anthropology, which examines the relationship of human beings to technology and, um, and how human society is changing according to that. So for example, this painting um, uh, encrypts the number 50, and 50 is the percentage of US jobs held by humans today that are at risk of being automated by 2024. Um, next, I just wanted to show you some examples of my work. This is the number 67, and this was a painting that I did about a series that I was inspired by looking at the differences between um, artificial intelligence and the human mind, and what actually human beings bring to the table, or what can and can't be replicated by machine intelligence. So. Um, so it, it, I found the number 67 to be interesting because then and, and it says it's the milliseconds it takes for the human brain to form a microexpression, and, and microexpressions are how human beings communicate without using language. Um, and you know, 
that that's something that's um, I think that I found to be um, not replicable, not replicatable. I don't know if that's a word. But, um, anyway, so next slide. This is a um, this is a project I did at the New World Trade Center. I was commissioned by um, the the one of the curators there and, and the Public Art Fund as part of their 40th anniversary to create a work of art that um, interrupted the commercials that were playing on 20 screens, I believe, um, every 10 minutes for 10 seconds. And, um, and what I chose to write in my own language was relentless tenderness. And these, um, my shapes um, both flew through the space and also the words themselves were echoed. So it was an actual, it was the first time that there was an actual translation of what was being said within the work. Um, this is a large scale work that addresses, um, again, it's about um, the effects of technology on, for this time, nature. And, um, and these are the numbers five and two, and they represent um, hundred millions of plastic straws used every day in the United States and the number of times that they would have circled the earth respectively. Um, and this is a large scale um, monumental kind of um, 20 feet long high work. This is a sculptural work that I recently showed at Jessica Silverman Gallery um, and, and I just wanted to show it because uh, my work does translate into three-dimensional ob objects as well. And um, blue blockers are actually um, technology that you can use to block blue light from your screens. So I was, um, I wanted to make a, this is, and this is the number six um, embedded into another shape. Um, most recently, I've been very, very inspired by um, some of the ancient tablets that Laura showed, for example, the Rosetta Stone, and wanted to recreate um, versions of those that represent today's technology and that have um, text written in them and that also incorporate elements of um, our natural environment that we might be losing. So, um, and then the words that are written there is the title of the, of the painting. And um, so, Back to you again. <laughs> so Hayal and I were clearly paired because of our interest in language and communication. Uh, they're definitely both very strong themes in our respective practice. Um, and also because of our interest in writing in particular as a technology. And you know, writing is a tool that we have created as humans. And uh, the oldest writing that we have is thousands and thousands of years old. So uh, up here, there's a picture of a tablet. Uh, this is from um, Mesopotamia. And this is proto-cuneiform. This is from the fourth millennium BC. Um, and most writing systems uh, start out in a very pictographic way. And they're not actually representing human speech, but they're representing ideas. And over time, they can come to be, um, the, the characters will change, they'll become um, a little bit more simplified, they'll, they might become linear and ordered, and that's a clear signal. If you're ever, by the way, uh, if you're ever in that, what is that show, At Atlantis? Uh, where James, I remember the movie James Spader is like, he suddenly sees this, this inscription, they're like, is it writing? And uh, he looks at it and he says, well, you know, you can tell it's linear, there's a certain number of characters, clearly this represents human speech. So when it makes that transition, it's very obvious. Um, so pictographic writing often does um, become linear. Uh, it becomes glottographic representative of speech, but that takes thousands of years. Um, and so what you see on the right above is um, how cuneiform emerged out of this pictographic writing system um, and became representative of speech and was actually used to, to represent several, you know, lots of different languages. And it was made by pressing a, a reed into the surface of, of wet clay. Um, and the, the image on the right there is uh, a text uh, from the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, in Akkadian. And this is the, the famous account of the flood. Um, and so that's from the seventh century BC. So it, you can see it took a long time to get to that point. 
Um, and then, of course, we have lots and lots of texts uh, that are available now in cuneiform in this writing system. So that's really, this is a picture, by the way, of, um, again, of the Rosetta disk. This is the Rosetta wearable disk, and it's magnified here uh, closer to 1,000 power. Um, and this is what we're really exploring with the Rosetta disk. Is, so as soon as you have written down language, what that does is it frees human language and communication from its temporal bounds, right? It's not... It's no longer um, embedded in a temporal moment, uh, in a particular context. It's free from that, and it can, um, it can last over time in that form. Um, it can be shared with distant recipients and read by people who may not even be the, the original intended recipient. Um, so that was a really amazing technological discovery for humans, and of course we have writing that is with us t still today. We are very, a very literate society. Um, and so that's what we're exploring with the Rosetta Disk. We're trying to see, you know, can we use writing to push information even further into the future, thousands of years into the future. Um, and one of, but, but some of the things, the, some of the questions this, this raises for me um, as we're trying to move in particular text into the future. So text is a kind of encoding. Like human languages are encodings of our experiences here on planet Earth. And all those 7,000 languages are seven different encoding systems, like Hayal was talking about her own encoding system. Um, when you write down language, that's another layer of encoding. Now imagine if you are going to take a text like the Epic of Gilgamesh and store it in DNA. Right? Then you have to take your text, you have to make it into binary, right? you have to get it into that format, and then you need to translate it into the nucleotides of DNA. And this is what people are starting to do to be able to store data, store images, all different kinds of, kind of like the information that you would store in your computer, you can now store in DNA. Um, but the question this raises is that if we're using this kind of medium and trying to move information into the future this way, then how are people even going to discover the information that we've archived? How are they going to be able to decipher it and decode it? And even if they get that text out of it, that epic of Gilgamesh, how are they even going to understand what it means? Are they even going to understand the language that it was written in? Or are we just kind of passing more and more puzzles into the future? Um, and I'm very interested in this question of how we talk to the future, especially the long-term future. Um, and I think it's increasingly important for us to be able to understand how to do that and how we pass our knowledge and hopefully our, our wisdom into the future. So um, almost as early as the first conversation that Hayal and I had, we realized what we wanted to do was explore and experiment with and for our project we wanted to create our own message for the future. And uh, there, are, there are some good examples out there. I mean, besides the, the Rosetta Project, which is one attempt at this, there are historical examples as well. So the Voyager disc, the, the beautiful golden Voyager record that is on the, um, the Voyager um, mission that has now exited the solar system, um, is, um, has kind of pictographic symbols. And the, the interesting thing, though, is that this isn't necessarily meant for humans. It's about humans, but it's meant for others that might discover and, and find it and try to decipher it. And I'm, um, I'm actually also on the board of directors of the METI project, which is like uh, SETI, which you've probably heard of the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. But METI is a messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, and I'm interested in that because of the long-term communication aspect. And what a lot of the, um, the people who are involved with, with METI and projects like METI are doing now is starting to think about how to send messages using things like the Very Large Telescope and infrared laser pulses. We can send messages into interstellar space and direct these at exoplanets. And it may take, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years to get there. And if a message ever comes back, how are we even going to know what we sent? <laughs> this is what I'm wondering about. Um, so I'm interested in, in the question from that perspective, this long-term communication perspective. 
And we've done similar things at the Long Now Foundation. We have, uh, so one of our, ro our Rosetta disks is actually on the surface of Comet 67P. Uh, that was a European Space Agency uh, project. Um, and we also included our Rosetta data on the Space IL Bearsheet lunar lander, which attempted a landing a few weeks ago. And if you followed that, you know that didn't end super well. But um, our archive was on that craft and may, in fact, have, have, have survived the landing. Um, but all of these, these examples that we have of these attempts at long-term archiving or communication, the, the, they're increasingly off-world. But who are we talking to when we send things off world? Are we talking to others? Are we talking to ourselves? So um, at the end of the day, after um, meeting with Laura, we decided that we weren't really interested in um, sending a message to extraterrestrials. We wanted to um, we wanted to communicate with future humans and and leave behind a message specifically for um, future humans to find on Earth, and um, and um, for us to be able to do that, we first had to imagine what the future of the Earth would be like. So, what is the future of the Earth that? this message would be found. And, um, and will it be the same today? Will we be looking at the same conditions of the Earth? But as we all know, um, in current state of climate change, it's, um, there's a real chance that neither bees will be around to decipher our message, nor humans will be around. So um, in that case, that um, led us to think about who would, who would we be writing this message to if there was no future to write the message to. Um, in other words, we realized that in order to create a message to the future, we need to create a message that impacts the present and still be valid in the era that it is deciphered. Um, it was imperative that the message that create real change now so that it could exist in the future. Without the message that we create, there was no future. Um, but when, when there's a, um, when there's a state of turmoil or calamity as we're facing right now, it's almost Im impossible to imagine a reality um, that is the complete opposite of what we're living in. So in order to create or imagine the most impactful message, we realized that we needed to completely suspend our belief in present reality and allow ourselves um, the freedom to construct our own utopia. And um, Laura and I decided that in our utopia, that we would think of the Earth as a whole, that we would not have political regions, nations, or countries, and that we would consider the human species as one. And second of all, we would give equal importance and value to the survival of other beings that we share this planet with. So, and only after that could we create a message that speaks to the universal experience of being alive, and a message that elicits emotion and that inspires hope, hopefully. Um, before um, reinventing the wheel, we decided to look into modifying some texts that already existed. And um, Laura, in her previous project, had already um, worked on um, using the Universal um, Declaration of Human Rights, specifically the preamble. And we looked at it, and you know, Laura said she has a beautiful word for it. It's in declarees. So, you know, we decided to um, simplify it, make it a little bit more clear, and correct the syntax. Um, so this is the first version that we came up with. Um, but we also wanted to include um, in our message um, beings that are in addition to human beings. So we edited the text to include um, every living being because of our belief in the necessity for interdependent ecosystems and the need for ethical systems that promote the diversity of life. So at the end of the day, this message seemed logical and, you know, simple, but, um, you know, we realize and know that human beings generally mean well and, you know, and they intend and respect well, but, um, but we felt that we needed to actually um, come up with a message that perhaps changes um, 
the social constructs and value systems that, that has created the circumstances that we're experiencing right now. Um, that we needed to create a message that, change, that creates a shift and change in the mindset of humans and um, that creates a change um, in the natural environment through a natural change in human beings' outlook on how they create value. So in this sense, um, our message had to liberate humans from their current value systems, particularly in the way that they value themselves. What do humans value? What do we value right now? We seek value and validation through material acquisitions. And excess material acquisitions generate excess trash, excess plastic, excess chemicals, and excess carbon. Um, so we wanted to ask ourselves, is there a way to want to consume less overall? And could it be possible for human beings to want less? And essentially, could human beings want not? So this is how we came up with this composite word. We created the word want not. And we thought that this would be our message to the future. Um, we really like the simplicity of it. Um, we found it easy on the tongue and you know, quick on the ears. It was catchy, positive, serious, but also somehow humorous at the same time. And one could easily meditate on it, either knowing the meaning or not. Um, you know, you could easily apply this message to a multitude of situations that you're facing. It didn't only have to be about excess consumption. Um, and you could use it to um, repeat it kind of like a mantra. And it was a, it was a message of a total and complete liberation from whatever you want it to be. So after creating this message, we wanted to um, make it into a, a universal language. So we thought um, we didn't want it to exist solely in English. So we thought that we could use my encryption system to translate it and then create a visual um, symbol um, for anyone to embrace from any linguistic background and that they could adapt it. And, and this is how we encrypted it and, and then composited all the shapes together to create what we believe to be a sigil of some sort. And so this is the two-dimensional realization of want not. And, um, and when, we, when Laura and I were initially discussing what we wanted to create, we did want to bring an object into the world. So um, to kind of proliferate all over the world and exist as its own thing, not just a two-dimensional um, realization. So, we thought the best way to do that would be to possibly 3D print um, this sigil that we made. And in order to do that, we contacted um, Sandy Kurth from UC Berkeley's Emerging Objects Lab. And um, one of the reasons we wanted to work with Sandy is because he is leading research on 3D printing techniques with experimental materials that are eco-friendly. And Sandy's actually here with us tonight, and we wanted to invite him to talk a little bit more about the lab and the work that he's doing there. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm just going to walk through this process for a second and explain a little bit about uh, how we kind of work with these more experimental materials in this technology. Um, so emerging objects, um, the lab I'm a part of, basically produces 3D printed uh, functional work for the most part and architectural work um, in materials like clay. Uh, this, this 3D printed cabin here has a facade constructed of printed grape skin and coffee and sawdust, all materials we kind of found and recycled. Um, we've worked with ground up car tires. Um, we've experimented with making um, Habitats for endangered animals, like this ceramic printed nesting system for the Cassin's Auklet. So that's kind of the, the realm we work in. Uh, my part of all this is mostly in the production of ceramic objects, because um, I come from a kind of ceramic sculpture background, um, and the production of softwares that can make these technologies more accessible to everyone. So part of what we do is build tools for high school and university students to 
kind of create their own objects without having to understand how to code or 3D model or do anything fancy. Um, so one example of that, just to kind of segue into the use of terracotta here, um, is a, a project we called Mud Frontiers, which was um, on display until about a week ago at the Rubin Center um, in El Paso. Basically, we, we shared a bunch of 3D printing machines with high school and college students on both sides of the um, US-Mexico border and had them go out and collect local material, local clay, and then design their own objects with some of our tools and then produce them. So we were able to create a, a work that was a collection from both sides of the border with material from both sides. Um, and then we printed a large-scale adobe structure just as kind of a sculptural monument to this idea. Um, so, moving into the want not, uh, we decided to try to print this in terracotta, but it was a particularly interesting challenge because usually when we work with these materials, we, we design around the constraints of the, the machine or the software or the, the ways in which we can make something. But here, the object came first and the, the ideas behind the object came first. And, um, Together with Hyal, we kind of started to think about how to make it three-dimensional or, or plushy in this form uh, that you've probably seen as it's been passed around. And so to print it, we had to kind of come up with some new ideas. We, we actually um, supported the object as it was being made in a bed of sand, um, which was kind of a, a nice new approach because normally when you 3D print something, you have a lot of waste material to support a complex object. Um, but this time we just were able to use sand around the clay, which will now just be used again on the next project. Um, and the result is a, a fired terracotta piece that will both exist basically forever, but can also just kind of fall away into the landscape at some point if we, if we so desire. Um, so here it is. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, and so, oh, I lost the thing. And so, um, this is this is actually a want not flag that's waving in front of the San Jose Museum right now. Um, our, one of our main goals when Laura and I decided to create this message was that we wanted this message to be widely available to the maximum number of people that could access it and also for this sigil and for the 3D shape to proliferate on its own and exist on its own and be used however people wanted to use it and to, you know, we made t-shirts from it, we can make a flag, you can 3D print it, whatever you would like to do with it. Um, and so at the very end of our project we created a website where you can actually go on whatnot.info where you can either download the sigil in a two-dimensional form to print it out as you wish or in a 3D shape to print for yourselves. And of course, we encourage um, printing with biodegradable materials if you're into the 3D printing and also we encourage not getting too attached to the idea of wanting and whatnot. <laughs> Thank you for coming and joining. Uh, <laughs> that was so great to see again. Um, so I guess I'll just ask a few questions and then we'll open it up so that people can get involved. Uh, and what do you say? Do you do you speak the want want not? Or do you, do you share it? That's actually not my first question. I'm just trying to see how to phrase this question. Um, so this project is like definitionally um, discursive, right? Um, and it started really between you two and then Sandy at a certain point. And I'm just wondering, you know, we're a week later from when this project was first shown, when the want not was first shared. We can say probably a few thousand people have experienced it, whether that's um, through the conference in New York, the live stream here tonight as a flag, as your shirt, maybe on the freeway. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering, like, you know, that obviously changes the discursive project and has it impacted the way that you see the want not? Have you seen any interesting reception of it? Are you 
Is it meaning something different one week later um, as it goes on into the world? One of, one of the funny things uh, that we were talking about earlier is what people think it looks like. And we've gotten a lot of reactions. Uh, Sandy was saying earlier, his colleagues from Canada thought it was a moose. Um, when I've shared it on social media, a lot of people think it's a ginger root, some kind of a ginger root. So I think like, uh, you know, kind of what people are, are imagining it to be like is also kind of coloring their, their thoughts about the object as well as what, I, what I'm guessing. Uh, my experience was, um, especially when, after the presentation in New York, um, it was really amusing to me that so many people came up to me and said, I want this, I want a want not, I want, can you make it in plush? I want like gold jewelry, give me that. And I was like, wow, I, I really, really didn't expect that reaction. Um, but I guess, I mean, maybe, maybe we did think about it because that's the irony and that's what makes you think about what it is that you want and um, why you want it. We wanted it to be a compelling object and something that was almost like a logo um, because what, I, you know, what I've learned in my practice around the Rosetta Disk is that you want to have things be shared and you want them to be kind of viral. You want them to be available to the world. This is why we wanted to make the website so that people could download the objects and make their own, right? So that's, that's a really important part of how this lives on into the future. Yeah. Do you want to mention the, the publication as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. We have, um, so there's um, some booklets that, um, that we printed that has um, conversations between um, Laura and I, because this uh, coming up with a message is not, it didn't happen overnight. We've been, we worked on this for two months, I believe. Mm -hmm. And each week we had a scheduled um, meeting. And of course, in between the meetings, multiple emails. Mm -hmm. and, and because, you know, we like language, we like writing, and we wanted to also make a publication that um, existed mm -hmm. on yeah. its own. It also includes some of our poetry. Yes, and it <laughs> yeah, and includes some of our individual poetry in the publication as well. It, it probably adds up to 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, because you're right. Yeah, because originally it was like a 24-hour collaboration. Right? Yeah. Um, I know that you also both spoke about, I mean, one interesting outcome for this besides terracotta was uh, potentially going to be chocolate or going to be something edible, and I wonder if you want to... Yeah, I mean that seems to me a little. It's interesting because it's um, it's like a direct embodiment. You're asking someone to really absorb the message that you're putting out to the world, but it, it it puts some strains on want and and not wanting, especially in chocolate, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah we initially we did think about um, printing it in three uh, in chocolate also. Yeah, we like the idea of you know swallowing and literally incorporating the message into your body and also not creating excess with it. It's mm -hmm. still a possibility mm -hmm. if you want, you know, <laughs> you can definitely yeah. go and print it in 3D chocolate. I think that would be a great way to enjoy it. Oh, yeah, not. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I still want to do the chocolate. Yeah. We, we talked about CBD chocolate too. CBD chocolate, yeah, <laughs> definitely. In, in, in California only. <laughs> they have that in New York too, they I think. Maybe. Um, Laura, I'm interested to know what you thought about Hayal's language as, it became visible to you as a linguist. Just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested. Like, what, what? Did, were there any qualities that you noticed about it? And actually, actually, uh, have you explained? I guess maybe you, did you? I don't know if you mentioned that um, that the, the the language you've created is more or less, you know, uh, only known to yourself, um, except through certain moments of translation that you've shared. And I assume as part of creating the one night, you shared at least part of the encryption process with Laura. But in general, just to seeing it as as an as a voc as a language out in the world, what do you yeah what do you make of it? I, I was um, when I first found out about it, I was very fascinated by it, and I love the name Instant Paradise. Um, and uh, you know, I I've experienced a lot of writing systems. I study writing systems, um, so this was a very unique one. But I think that the the aspect of it that really um, captured my imagination the most. So I've worked. Um, in my work as a linguist, working on documenting some of the world's most endangered languages, you know, working with last speakers, um, 
and kind of recording their words. Uh, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about, um, about last speakers, you know, um, and what their experience of communicating must be like, especially to some, it's, it's such a strange thing sitting down, like, you know, using your language with somebody who isn't, you know, sort of from that historical trajectory. Um, and linguists are kind of weird to work with anyways. But, um, <laughs> but, but the idea is that, you know, these people have a whole system of encoding knowledge that um, has been developing for thousands of years and then suddenly it's going to be truncated when they die. Uh, unless other people, their, their children or their, their other generations are going to take it on. And that's a tough thing to do. Um, so he, with Hayal's um, Instant Paradise, it was interesting to experiment with that for the encoding of the message because she's the only one who really know. well, I know it a little bit now. I mean, I know how it works, but um, I mean, she invented it. it. It is powerfully meaningful to her and through her works, it is powerfully meaningful um, in a different but kind of similar way. And so being able to encode our message in something that is a system that's really deeply understood by only one person, I thought was kind of a beautiful um, expression of what this experience out there all around the world must be kind of like. And hi, I wonder what, um how working directly with a linguist through this project has has kind of influenced your rethinking of Instant Paradise and the way forward. I mean, um, I want to thank you because it was a dream come true for me to do this project and to work with not just a linguist, but a linguist like Laura. And because we share so many interests. Um, it has, it's, it's changed the way I look at it, in specifically the terms that she was talking about it. I hadn't really thought of it as a language of one, necessarily, and me as the only person that knows it. So um, my intention in creating it was to create a, a universal visual language. So, but the thing is, I don't share it with anyone. <laughs> I mean, I share it, I, sh I don't share the writing system with anybody, but I do share the fruits of the writing system. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's it's been an interesting experience, looking at it through her perspective, definitely. Um, well, I'd love to open it up to questions in the room. Oh, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> They, um, well, part of it is for a long period of human history, a language with, say, five to 10,000 speakers, you know, that would be an average human-sized language, and it could be very vital for a long time. Um, it's difficult for languages of those size, that size, to make a go of it in today's world. Um, there's a number of, of pressures against these languages. Sometimes it is, um, the, the world often doesn't uh, look very kindly on ling linguistic differences or cultural differences. And um, a lot of the people who speak these languages are also ones who are oppressed in various ways around the world. Um, they have often experienced dislocation from their land. Um, they've seen their resources shrink. They've been um, exposed to assimilatory education. This happened in the US, it happened in Australia, it's very common. Um, and a lot of pressures against, um, you know, a lot of people learn other languages and then they're just multilingual. But in the case of these languages, people are learning to speak another language and then leaving that language behind. Um, and so I think it's a big human rights issue as well. And what often, you would think that the knowledge would transfer to another language. Um, which supposedly it could, uh, theoretically it could, um, but that often doesn't happen. And so what happens is you have the kind of the knowledge and experience of all of these people who have their kind of their 
encoding of how to live sustainably in all of the different places on Earth, right? Um, in their languages, in their cultures, um, that is disappearing and it's not being moved into the future. Mm -hmm. It seems like it took seven, seven symbols to make, right? So I'm just wondering about your process of how you chose the elements, because there are many symbols inside, but we can't see all of them. But you must be able to see them when you look at it. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a composite of the seven shapes. So there's 31 shapes in my, in, in my alphabet, and when we decided on the message, want not, there was uh, individually, I believe, one, two, three, four different letters that needed to be incorporated because some of them repeat. I mean, this is also kind of like the, the in, you know, intuitive logic that I have about my own writing system. So the, the, um, the four shapes, some of them got canceled, some of them were lay layered on top of each other, and um, and what I do is that once they're layered on top of each other, a, a single shape emerges from the outlines of, of the shapes that are layered on top of each other. And then I draw the outline. When I look at this shape, I don't really see, in the, I see parts of shapes that I know, but um, the, the goal is to create a new shape. So um, sometimes I'll emphasize parts of it too if that makes any sense, you know, to create a whole shape that makes sense on its own. I don't know if that answered your question. Okay, yeah. Is there a, a writing system that Instant Paradise is closest to? Or, oh, I, don't want, I guess you don't want to give it away. <laughs> but is there, is, there, is, there, is there anything, just any shade to that in terms of? That's a good question. I, the reason that I came up with this system was, was because I wanted to make shapes. I wanted to see if I could create shapes from scratch, if I could invent a shape. Because I didn't, because I knew that whatever I put in back into the internet, which is inevitable, I knew that my artwork would exist online first. So um, I wanted to make something that did not exist online. And, and that was the compulsion of creating shapes. So, and then I, I, I looked into various um, shape uh, languages and alphabets, um, Sumerian cuneiform being one of them, for example. I looked at um, Turkish kilim patterns, which are actually a symbol language in themselves too. Um, but I also looked at, uh, when you think about it, the letters A, B, and C are shapes as well. Mm -hmm. So thinking about letters as shapes without reading them helped me a lot. But Initially, when I created the shapes, I wasn't thinking of them as an alphabet. I just was one, my compulsion was to create a shape that did not exist before. So I can't say that it looks like anything else. My aim was to create something that hadn't been created before, which is very difficult and kind of a crazy thing to want to attempt. And then once I started making them, I sat down and I said, okay, I'm repeating some of the shapes. I have an affinity for some of them. Which ones do I like most? And that's how I came up with, oh, I, I did an editing of the shapes and 31 were left. I don't know, it was a very convoluted way of creating a language, I guess. I didn't necessarily sit down and say, I'm going to make a, up a language and sit down and make them. Have you heard of a language made that way? No, I mean, it, it has, <laughs> the interesting thing is it has... The language it, of the internet, maybe, I don't know. It, there, there, there's properties of it that, you know, you can see in other writing systems a little bit, um, like the way um, characters, composite characters in Chinese, or Mayan glyphs, there's like, um, yeah. you know, kind of combinations of, of symbols into one larger symbol. Um, I was having, uh, I think it was when I was talking with my husband, I was like, hey, you should see this thing that I'm working on with Hayal, and he's like, oh, that looks like the, um, it remind him of the uh, arrival with the, mm -hmm. like, the squid creature. That's a spoiler, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Movie, yeah. But the, <laughs> the squid creatures, and they kind of, like, they ink out this, yeah, yeah. like, complex symbol for, and they, that they had to figure yeah. out. So it's kind of like if, uh, 
you know, the wild nut was presented these creatures that would probably, they would have an affinity for it. Yeah. And yeah, actually, I, yeah. we uh, we interviewed Ted Chang, who wrote Arrival, uh, yeah. as part as as a kind of way to research what we thought you, the direction of your project was going to be. That'll be published online soon. Oh, I'm that's not talking about that's that. really cool. Yeah, my my intent wasn't to necessarily um, communicate as words. I wanted it to be a, a language of feeling. I think, and to to create some sort of elicit some sort of emotion, and an understanding of universality through shapes, if that makes any sense. I, I wanted it, through experiencing this language, I wanted people to maybe see human beings not defined by countries or nations or borders, but as a unified whole. I wanted this language to make sense for everybody. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Hayao. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Sandy. This is an amazing project. And thank you to San Jose for hosting.